to you this afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, the Arboretum is special to all of us, and it's special to Kay, too. She's uh, quite aware of its history and role, uh, not just locally, but throughout the Midwest. Uh, Kay comes to us uh, quite experienced in terms of Arboretum garden, uh, Botanical Gardens. Her training in botany at Indiana University was followed by time at the Missouri Botanical Garden, uh, perhaps a stunning success story in terms of its influence uh, across the nation and around the world now. But for the last 17 years, uh, she's made a uh, distinguished career for herself at the <coughs> Chicago Botanical Garden. Uh, this institution, I just learned from her yesterday, uh, was built on 400 acres of wetland, <laughs> <laughs> which probably would never be allowed today. But, uh, so the situation is somewhat different, but many of the issues and problems, of course, that she confronts uh, are similar. She's uh, a specialist in plant conservation and restoration projects in, involving uh, reseeding and replanting. And she's worked extensively with uh, federal agencies, as I'm sure she'll uh, relate today. Anyway, uh, let's welcome Kay Havens, uh, who will be speaking to us this afternoon. Thanks. so much. Um, I think I have this on now. Can you hear me all right? Great. Okay, um, today is really a, a talk in three parts, and so I'm going to start. Uh, oh, it's four parts. Look at that. <laughs> Just set the scene a little bit. Uh, um, on uh, what the global and national context is for plant conservation, and then talk um, a fair bit about botanical capacity and why it's important and why it's lacking in our country, and how botanic gardens are fitting into that and how their roles are changing. And then the last roughly third of the talk will be uh, vision for the arboretum here and, and where I think um, you can go in the future. So I want to start just by mentioning uh, the global strategy for plant conservation. If you're not familiar with it, this is a document that was created um, in 2002 uh, by the Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity and signed on to by all the countries that are signatories to CBD. And even though we aren't, uh, the United States does get involved in trying to meet the 16 targets that are laid out in the strategy uh, that uh, we hope to meet globally by 2020. And uh, perhaps most relevant to you here is target four, which is at least 15% of each ecological region or vegetation type is secured through effective management or restoration. <coughs> there are a number of other targets uh, that you probably um, touch on, things about uh, sustainable development and seed banking and protecting important plant areas. Uh, but I think this one is probably the most relevant for you. Uh, nationally, we have the Plant Conservation Alliance, which is a network of the 10 land managing agencies and about 300 plus uh, NGOs. And uh, they too have created a framework for plant conservation in the United States, uh, ensuring that native plant communities and their populations are maintained, enhanced, and restored. You don't need to read this. This is just to show you that there is a lot of overlap between these two strategies, even though they were created completely independently. And uh, the goals, I think, are really very um, cogent for uh, conservation activities, growing partnerships and resources, connecting people and plants. I think that's something botanic gardens and gardens and arboreta do very well conserving natural resources, <coughs> encouraging research, promoting sustainability, and gathering and sharing data. So now on to botanical capacity and what that means and how it's lacking. Um, plants make up over 60% of the endangered species list in the United States, uh, but they get about 3% of the funding. And I'll show you a figure that illustrates that quite graphically in a minute. Um, also, plants under the en Endangered Species Act are protected only on federal land. And uh, about 30 states have rare plant laws, uh, but, you know, 20, nearly 20, don't and don't have any protections for plants at all. 
Uh, here's the figure I was mentioning. Um, so here's what plants get. Here's what animals get. <laughs> and uh, it's striking and shocking and, and distressing. Uh, the federal land managing agencies uh, manage about a third of the United States. And as such, they're really important partners in um, restoration and conservation activities. But they, even though we think they're rich, <laughs> they don't have a lot of money for land management activities. And so here looking from Park Service through to Bureau of Land Management, what they spend per acre per year on conservation and restoration. And it's a pretty shockingly low number, if you ask me. And there are um, very few botanists in these agencies. Uh, so in BLM, one botanist per 4.7 million acres. <laughs> um, I have like less than a quarter acre and I spend more than $3 a year on it. And I have a hard enough time keeping the weeds out of my own backyard. And so you can see why our lands maybe aren't managed as well as they could be, especially um, in terms of botanical resources. On top of that, you know, there are not too many of them, and they're poor, and they're old, too. <laughs> and most of them are due to retire in the next five years. And uh, one of the things I think academia has not been doing well is preparing students to move into these botanical careers uh, because there are very strict guidelines within the federal agencies on how many credit hours of botany you need to be a botanist. It's 24, and there aren't many universities that offer that anymore. This uh, is one of them. And the, you know, <laughs> I'm so pleased to be talking to a place that has a body department. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me smile. Um, so yeah, here's uh, showing uh, how many, this is self-reported federal botanist time to retirement. And as I mentioned, because we're not uh, talking as academics to the feds, uh, there's going to be a big hole here. And I think overall in this country we suffer from plant blindness. And this was uh, described by uh, James Wandersee several years ago, really the inability to see or notice plants in your environment, to value the, them, to recognize their importance, and to think that they're inferior uh, to animals and not worthy of conservation. So a few years ago, the Chicago Botanic Garden, working with Botanic Gardens Conservation International, um, got a grant to assess botanical capacity in the United States, which we defined as human, technological, and institutional resources that support education, research, and management in botany. And the report, the URL's there at the bottom, or you feel free to email me and I'll send you a copy, um, uh, is posted and you can read it in all its like 100 page glory or a four page executive summary. Uh, but it's a useful tool when you're trying to increase interest in botany. I use it a lot when I go to DC and talk to elected officials about why they should be investing in plants and plant sciences. One of the things we do in the report is we identify grand challenges that require botanical knowledge. Uh, so things like ecological restoration and food security and invasive species and biofuels and, and all these things that are happening maybe without the appropriate input from botanists. And we talk about um, what research and management are required to address those challenges. Uh, in the report, the research and management needs that were highlighted um, as the top four are invasive species biology, habitat and species monitoring, recovery and restoration, ecosystem function and services, and effects of climate change. So I think that fits really nicely uh, with the mission of the Arboretum here, the mission of a lot of botanic gardens and Arboretum to address some of these needs. <coughs> Oh yeah, here's the slide on why you, you make me smile. <laughs> you have a botany program. When I went to school, most universities did. 
but as of two, 2009, um, half or more of the universities had eliminated their botany programs, and that included eliminating most or all of the botany courses. Uh, so when botany and zoology merge into a biology program, often it's botany that's lost. So, um, let's see, here's the figure I want. Um, this is interesting because you have a botany department. Um, you might be asking what courses do students want versus what courses faculty think are really important. And I found it interesting that you know, faculty really focuses on a lot of um, basic science. And the students are interested in biogeography, restoration ecology, plant-animal interactions, invasive species biology. So really taking that botany to the next level and applying it uh, to solve some of these uh, problems. But all in all, I think you know, this is kind of the crux of the biscuit, that in order to have um, political will for plant conservation and restoration, the general public, policy um, makers, elected officials, government officials, need to understand that plants are not optional, that we can't live without them. And we're not going to be able to increase support for programs like the one you have here uh, without this um, getting through to anyone and everyone. And that's where I think botanic gardens and arboretum play a particularly important role. Um, botanic gardens originally uh, were started as collections of curiosities to showcase plants collected around the world, and isn't this fascinating, and you've never seen one like this before, and uh, also as centers for research on the medicinal uses of plants. But today, I think we're really evolving into centers for conservation and research, um, as well as beautiful displays that you can enjoy. Um, what we found with the botanical capacity assessment was that um, even though uh, many universities are dropping botany programs and there's not a lot of funding um, in government agencies. That in many cases, botanic gardens and arboretas are filling those, uh, filling those gaps and offering um, education, practice, research in these sciences. Uh, botanic gardens and arboreta manage a documented collection of plants. That's the definition of a botanic garden. And as such, they are sites of incredible species richness. We host collectively, and this, this number is about six or seven years old, I think it's more than that now, 150 million visitors a year. Uh, I know uh, Chicago gets about a million visitors a year, and I know you get somewhere near that as well. So I think we are the perfect organizations to talk about the importance of plants, uh, provide this outreach, and convince our visitors uh, to advocate for plants and plant conservation. Some of the ways we can do this are through citizen science programs. Uh, we run, I mentioned yesterday, Plants of Concern, which is a volunteer rare plant monitoring program. We have about 300 volunteers every year who are monitoring 600 rare plant sites. And we're not alone in this enterprise. Um, NEPCOP, which is New England Plant Conservation Program, and Rare Care at uh, University of Washington are other great examples. And it's not just rare plant monitoring. There are other programs that focus on phenology and invasive species monitoring. And so I think um, this is an area where we can have a unique impact. Uh, I want to talk a little about our science career continuum at the garden because I think it's a, a nice model to bring new people into the field and you have to start young and we started middle school and that may not even be young enough uh, but we have a mentoring program that starts with middle schoolers includes high schoolers includes our research experience for undergrad interns includes our um, graduate students each mentoring the step below them, the age group younger than them, so that there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and um, as well as oversight from the scientists. And once students go through that continuum, and not all students do every step, obviously, um, we can help them, I'm sorry that this is making 
so much noise. Um, we can help them find jobs through our conservation and land management intern program. And this is a program we run with federal agencies that provides five to ten month internships on public land uh, for about 100 to 120 students uh, every year. And there's some of them <laughs> finished with their workshop and so excited about it. <laughs> so enough about me. <laughs> Let's talk about you um, and your mission and your vision and some of the things um, where I think we could work together. So this I found on your website and it's a wonderful mission statement and lofty goals and I agree with all of them. I do think there are um, areas where we could expand a little and, and work even further. Um, I'm a big proponent of building institutional cohesion and working together to find a common vision. I would like to provide a safe and welcoming experience for all visitors, no matter what the reason they want to come here. An outstanding venue for restoration research and outreach, opportunities for all students, and promote sustainability. And I'll talk about each of these. So first, on institutional cohesion, this is just a, a little bit about how I like to work. Um, I like to work as part of a team. Um, so I would see coming in and uh, reinvigorating a strategic planning process that uh, would involve um, everyone who is a stakeholder in the Arboretum. We might conduct an outside review, benchmark the programs here against other uh, similar institutions, ask who we serve and how, how do we translate our science into policy, adaptive management, education, and other initiatives. Part of my job is to give voice to your collective vision, and so as we develop that together, then I would try to go out and sell that, and encourage you to dream big, because that's the way we take the small steps. I also see my role as providing support in terms of adequate resources for you to do your job, um, achieving your institutional goals, working as a team, <coughs> and make sure that your interests and dreams are presented and championed to the stakeholders for the Arboretum. In terms of benchmarking, I'm going to show you just a, a few similar institutions and what I think is uh, really interesting about some of those. So Shaw Nature Reserve is, um, it was formerly Shaw Arboretum of the Missouri Botanical Garden, uh, a wonderful property about 35 miles southwest of St. Louis and uh, managed as as this is, mostly through restoration and managing native habitats, but they do have an arboretum function and they have a pinetum and some other historical collections that are very important. They're known uh, for their restoration practice and study. They've got about 2,500 acres, I think, all under active restoration. They have this wonderful on-site housing facility for school groups. And this allows school groups to come out and become immersed for uh, a weekend or for several days in instruction at the Arboretum, or, I'm sorry, the Nature Reserve. <laughs> it was the Arboretum when I was there. Um, and so I think that's something we might want to consider. I don't know what the possibility is for doing something like that here, but uh, it has really increased the programming abilities at Shaw. <laughs> They're also known for their wonderful uh, Whitmire Wildflower Garden which has um, home landscape scale demos, and I know uh, you do somewhere under the snow out back here as well. Um, but I think they do a fabulous job at that and uh, might be something to look at and benchmark against and, and learn from. And then uh, also in the St. Louis area is the Tyson Research Center. And Tyson was set up as uh, a field site a research center for uh, students at Washington University and other 
institutions in the St. Louis area. And what they do um, extraordinarily well is provide facilities for research on site. And so uh, there's some lab facilities, there's lecture facilities, there's computers there that the students can use when they're doing research at Tyson. So not a lot of running back and forth to the university. And this is the UC Davis Arboretum, which I have not visited myself, but I've heard a lot about through um, American Public Gardens Association. <coughs> Pardon me. Let me take a quick drink. Um, and they're really known for their um, incorporating outreach, public art exhibits, all kinds of things to bring diverse audiences. into the Arboretum. They're also known for providing a kind of cohesiveness amongst uh, the university community and serving as a gateway, which I think is important. So going back to some of those points that were in the vision slide, um, provide a welcoming and safe experience for all visitors. We are in many cases the threshold for the community of Madison to the university. And we serve as a, a, an introduction to the university and a welcoming space. Um, venue for nature experiences for all kinds of people. We can provide leadership on native landscaping, invasive plant issues, promoting sustainable sites. I don't know what all is um, in the garden back here, but um, a pollinator garden, um, Carbon sequestration garden is something uh, we've been thinking about promoting plants that are long-lived and deep-rooted and attractive and telling people if you uh, take up your sod and you put in this garden, that's the equivalent of X number of cars off the road. And uh, green roof gardens. I don't know if that's a craze here yet. Um, it's a craze in Chicago. and. Um, I saw at Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center these kind of sloped trays that um, they were displaying green roof plants on, but at a level where you could look at them uh, without getting up on a roof and testing different um, plants for that application, which I thought was really unique and interesting. I would encourage us to be inclusive and move beyond the choir to invite people in here um, with different interests and develop programming and events that gets them through the gate. And uh, by doing this, we can educate by stealth and uh, get them interested in plants in a way that uh, they might not have thought of in the past. In terms of providing a venue for restoration research and outreach, well, you already do a fantastic job. And uh, I'm in awe with some of the restoration research that goes on here, it's incredible. Um, areas where I think are particularly important are responding to global climate change, invasive species, fragmentation, pollinators, certainly now even more than ever, um, the plight of the monarch has been getting a lot of press, and uh, I think um, pointing out the role of these plants in providing uh, habitat for pollinators is really important. This may mean building the infrastructure here on site to promote this kind of research, increase it, make it easier for students, and uh, uh, generally uh, welcoming to students from all disciplines. And also making our research count. So have connections with the global plant conservation community, IUCN and the Global Partnership for Plant Conservation, and Plant Conservation Alliance, the Alphabet Soup here, Botanic Garden Conservation International, Center for Plant Conservation, Ecological Restoration Alliance of Botanic Gardens, Nature Conservancy. All of these groups have targets and are trying to contribute to global efforts. And we should be counted, we should stand up and be counted in these. And maybe you are already and I, I just don't know about it. I think um, if we're smart about how we position our programs and talk about how we're unique, that opens up new funding opportunities. 
Okay, opportunities for all students. Um, and this includes K through 12, um, the university students, and not just science students. Um, I think, you know, science is always going to be at the, the core of the mission here. But is there a role for art students and music students, drama students? Um, this is uh, University of Michigan's Nichols Arboretum, Shakespeare in the Arb, that they put on every year. And that brings in a whole new audience in a way um, that uh, opens the doors and, and makes you even more relevant. I would love to, um, I've worked a lot with internship programs, I would love to build an internship program here that provides opportunities for this university students as well as students from across the country. Um, and I think uh, also we can serve a unifying role, particularly around issues of su sustainability for the community and for the university at large. And lastly was promote sustainability, um, and really looking at that in three ways, environmental sustainability, so uh, lower our carbon footprint, you know, set a good example, uh, promote sustainable gardening practices, economic sustainability, that our funding is diverse and stable, and uh, social sustainability, that the staff is happy and valued and uh, our decisions are as transparent as possible and so that the, uh, the morale at the Arboretum is one that's very productive and happy. Let's be happy. <laughs> um, <clears throat> modernizing the land ethic. Okay. Um, Aldo, what a fantastic inspiration. I, I love reading. Aldo Leopold, and some of his ideas are still as timely as ever. Many of his ideas are still as timely as ever. But I do think we find ourselves in a little bit of a quandary if we're trying to restore back to pre-settlement conditions in that um, I'm sorry. Many, uh, many of those goals uh, going back 250 years may not be achievable in today's climate. But I think we can use that historic reference as a really strong guide point. I don't think it's time to abandon a historical reference system at all. Um, I think it can help us as we monitor the changes that are occurring in our natural areas. We test new seed sourcing strategies. We may be bringing in seed of species that are appropriate here, but germplasm that's from a little further afield but trying to put those plant communities on evolutionary trajectories that will make them resilient and stable into the future. And recognizing that our practices are ongoing and iterative, and that many of the forces that we're dealing with, climate change, invasives, fragmentation, nitrogen pollution, aren't going away. They aren't going to get better anytime soon. So we have to continue uh, to learn and adapt. How are we going to do this? <laughs> I've given you a number of ideas, and uh, of course, all of these things cost money. Um, I know you've been applying for research and education grants, and I envision doing that and doing that more. Um, for us, cooperative agreements with uh, Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service, Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service have been very lucrative. Um, we get a lot of funding through them, and uh, I would hope to continue that here. Uh, investigating corporate sponsorships. Uh, we have a corporate roundtable where we invite corporations in to uh, have meetings at the garden and talk about sustainability issues. And in doing such, they get to know us, and many of them in turn sponsor us. Uh, increase earned income, fee-based programs, sales, facility rentals, special events. I think we can uh, dream and dream big there. Build endowment. Uh, everybody wants endowment. It's the hardest money to raise, but uh, we can try. 
and then update the master site plan so that we have plans on paper that we can present to potential donors and encourage them to uh, contribute uh, capital for some of these projects. And I'll just leave you um, with a little bit of philosophy that I think it's important for us to put our work in a global context, but recognize that what we do is local and is really important. And that's my favorite plant. If you weren't around yesterday, that's my favorite plant. And that's my daughter. <laughs> and um, continue to be guided by the wisdom of, of Aldo. And this is one of my favorite quotes of, of his. And um, I think there's a really bright future here. And I hope to be part of it. So thank you for the opportunity. And uh, happy to answer any questions. here to serve funding sources and could you elaborate a little bit maybe you've given some great examples uh, for other things but what you have in mind there? Um, I spent a lot of time in DC talking to agencies about what their needs are and um, through that get ideas of programs that we can develop that meet those needs. That's how the intern program came, uh, came about. It's talking to the Forest Service and them saying, every unit um, uh, monitors rare plants differently, and we don't know what's happening unit to unit. And I said, could we write a manual for you that would help? And sure, we'll give you $80,000 and write a manual for us. And so I think keeping the conversation open with funding agencies and understanding what their needs are and not you know not advocating mission creep to do things that are totally unrelated but if it fits with what you're doing and you have some expertise uh, it could be a really good way to generate income. In the back. Okay, do you mind bouncing back to your slide about diversifying funding? Could, could you go back to that? I got a couple of quick questions. I, I thank you very much for that and I appreciate your vision but um, one thing I'm curious about is a little bit about your management style. You could delve into that a little bit more. So are you more of a, do you, would you organize a management team around you? Are you a delegator? Do you would like to be more hands-on from an administrative side? And then um, after you answer that, if you could just go down the list here and just, could you explain a little bit about what kind of experience you have with each of those bullets and, and uh, your success? Yes. <laughs> um, my management style is I like to work with a team. I don't like to make decisions by myself, but to include people and make decisions that I think are best for everyone. I am not a micromanager by any stretch. I am happy to delegate when it's appropriate, um, but I do enjoy regular communication with the group I'm working with. Does that answer? Yeah. Okay. That's fair enough. Uh, continue to apply for research and education grants. Um, I probably have the most experience in this area of, of any of them. Uh, I write personally probably five to ten proposals every year and help my team write equally as many. Uh, we have a pretty good success rate on that and it's everything from uh, straight science to outreach, uh, collaborating with our education department to develop a climate change curriculum uh, funded by NASA. Uh, partnered with University of Illinois Chicago, wrote an IGERT proposal that was uh, funded, which is a graduate training, NSF graduate training uh, grant. <coughs> <coughs> Cooperative agreements with stewardship agencies, I also do a lot, uh, particularly with Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service. Uh, I like these because they are less detailed proposals. Once you have a personal relationship with someone in the agency and you can talk to them, 
Uh, a proposal might be a page instead of 15. Uh, you often hear back right away, and we have a really good success rate on those. Um, increasing and roughly what level of funding? Uh, we get um, from the Bureau of Land Management three to four million dollars a year in funding, and probably a couple hundred thousand from Forest Service, about five hundred thousand from Fish and Wildlife Service. So Where does that work take place? <coughs> Uh, some of it is local, but for the Bureau of Land Management, it's in the western U.S. So we have a lot of programs happening in the Colorado Plateau and Great Basin. But a lot of it is also modeling, which happens <laughs> in Chicago. But we're just modeling things that are happening out west. So uh, Increasing earned income. Uh, certainly, this is something our garden has done very well um, in terms of optimizing facility rentals and commanding a very high price for some of those rentals. Fee-based programs like education programs, symposia, uh, <coughs> certificate programs. We do plant sales, um, special events like um, we've been doing this uh, farm-to-table dinner that uh, is really fun and it, I think it would be really fun here too, where we work with um, local farmers and chefs and we charge about $200 a plate and donors come in and, and pay a lot for a really good dinner and we get a lot of money left over. <laughs> so um, something like that uh, could work. Endowment, um, that I don't do personally, but I do in collaboration with our development department. And so when donors are identified that have an interest in science, I'll talk to them about um, a program that I think fits their interests. And so we've raised endowment for the seed bank, for my position, for our seed curator position, um, for our GIS lab. Uh, but again, that, that needs some help from a development person. I don't have access uh, personally to the kinds of research that a development person would do and, and to know what the prospects are out there and who's, who's got money and what their capacity for giving is. Um, and then lastly, uh, planning to, to have things on the shelf. I was intimately involved in the planning of our new research building and that was uh, a $50 million capital campaign. And so designing what the scientists need, but then portioning it up and putting prices on it so it could sell. Um, I've had some experience with, again, that, that's done best with uh, a development team. Yes? Um, hi, Kay, my name is Steve Lovelock. I work at the Earth Partnership Program here within the Harbor Inn. Mm -hmm. We do that logical restoration of school grounds, rain gardens, and things like that. So I was intrigued by your statement about moving beyond the choir to develop new programming that gets more people through the gate. But what we do is we actually get our people outside the gate to go to those people. Which is also great. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm finding we get all kinds, we reach all kinds of people, um, non-traditional, people who might not visit here, but we can find them by working with teachers in the school setting. So I'm, little, I'm curious about your experience in the, I heard more about outreach than about education. And you mentioned a little bit about an asset K-12 program just now. So if you share a little bit about your experience with that, reaching that K-12 community and professional development for teachers. Right. Um, that is a different department than, than mine, but I certainly collaborate with the education department quite a bit. And uh, we have done um, the climate change curricula, as I mentioned. Um, we've developed uh, a floral report card program, which I talked a little bit about yesterday. And we're piloting that in some schoolyards as well as in other botanic gardens to engage kids in taking phenology measurements on uh, cloned plants uh, and compare those to others around the country. Um, and then professional uh, education, I've been involved in a lot of the certificate programs that we offer and some of the teacher training that we offer as well. And then even a little further afield, uh, I've been involved with our urban ag uh, crew 
who are reaching underserved communities in the city of Chicago and addressing the food desert issue and growing gardens, um, primarily food plants um, in these areas, but in some cases when food plants aren't appropriate, we do native seed farming there. And we've um, also worked with the Cook County Boot Camp, a correctional facility, to do urban agriculture and to, um, it's a facility for nonviolent offenders and it's a 15 month program. And so urban agriculture is a skill that uh, they can choose to learn while they're in that program and then take that um, outside the prison walls when they are released and have a skill that hopefully they will use instead of selling drugs, which is usually what got them there in the first place. Joy. Um, we have a lot of centers on campus. We have a lot of um, activities that overlap somewhat with some of the things that you're saying. So what would your approach be to figure out where the Arboretum's best um, focus and strategy would be? It's really, I think, about figuring out the best strategic plan for us. Yeah, um, I would have to get to know the campus, mm -hmm. and that would take a while, and it would be reaching out through all of you to your connections in different departments and different institutes, and really, you know, taking the time to meet folks from horticulture, from botany, from the Nelson Institute, uh, and so on and so forth, um, to, to grasp the context, which I don't know right now, <laughs> and, and then take that um, and work on a strategic plan. The Arboretum is this property and outlying properties as well, but the core property nested within an urban environment as it is is subject to a lot of interaction with the type of things that we find ourselves dealing with stormwater runoff, uh, human incursion, <coughs> invasive species, and so forth. And I'm wondering what thoughts you have on managing a natural area that's really nested in an urban environment like this. Well, it's an uphill struggle, isn't it? <laughs> or downhill. <laughs> areas of the garden we're in a very suburban area where invasives are pervasive and continually entering our property and so it, it will take continual management uh, we're never going to be able to just say the woods are wonderful and let them go it's it's a never ending If there aren't any more questions, uh, I want to... I have a couple of ones. Why, why do you think botany is diminished over the years now? <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> there, 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 there are more research journals in botany now than there ever were. In the old days, there was the American Journal of Botany, and that was about it. I mean, there's dozens and dozens of journals. There's obviously a lot of research going. Um, I think botany departments are perhaps not viewed as overhead generators the way some other departments on campus can bring in really big grants, and so that may be part of the problem. I think people have become disconnected from the outdoors and natural history and uh, are more interested in gadgets and, and things than getting out and down on their hands and knees. And, with plants, and I, I don't know all the reasons why we see this you know, drastic decrease in botany and this lack of funding for botany, uh, but I'm all ears if people have ideas and suggestions to, to uh, address it. Can I ask a follow-up on that same line? So you showed us the very depressing <laughs> statistics of the loss of botany programs um, and implied that botanical gardens and arboreta could fill the void. But as mentioned, we don't have a void here at the University of Wisconsin. We have a strong herbarium, a botany department, horticulture, agriculture, and an arboretum. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, we might be viewed as special. <laughs> and so how could you see those, us taking advantage of of that specialness, that uniqueness, 
and advancing plant sciences mm -hmm. in ways that other universities can? That's a great question. Um, I think because there is so much research on plants here, that's a great foundation for uh, outreach through the Arboretum, um, telling people about some of the wonderful things the Botany Department does uh, in a way that, you know, you're not going to get a million visitors tromping through Birch Hall, um, but, <laughs> but you will hear it. And it's Despite a way the beauty of it. <laughs> 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 So I, I think there is a, a role um, for a really strong partnership between the department and the, the library. I don't know if I completely answered that. Good answer. <laughs> Other questions? Well, let's thank Kay once again. Uh, a few more questions. We yeah. have to whisk her off in a few minutes, but we could talk for another 10 or 20 hours. Yeah, I'm really interested to hear what you are interested in and where you see the arboretum going. I thought there was another um, Ask a question about the kinds of materials.